uh, towards the patrons that apparently are far too hard to read, but <laughs> that is uh, one of the little foibles of the rudimentary world that we're doing to try to keep within the operations of our Wi-Fi and blah, 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 and the resolution of it. Anyway, um, we do the best we can, kids. Uh, another evolution hour underway. We'll see how, if it goes actually into an hour, because I kind of got three topics this time around. Um, on Jensen being vulnerable and Lauren Bulbert in Congress, which was just an impromptu thing that came up. And Cuttlebone jumped the gun, gee whiz. So uh, let's first deal, jump in with the exciting world of Jensen. Um, he goes all the way down to the end of his next chapter. Hi, Barbara, uh, which is called Vulnerable, uh, which is on Europe and the R1B lineage and its supposed origins. Uh, and right at the end of the chapter, he drops uh, the next technical source in his little biz, which is a paper from 2010 by Cruciani et al. Uh, from Nature, uh, I'll be uh, sticking, uh, Nature Genetics, uh, I'll be sticking the link to that in. Uh, and it relates to the occurrence of that particular haplogroup in some African populations with particularly an RV88 group um, showing up there. Now, Jensen gives it quite a peculiar spin, uh, but he had to step over the content of the paper to do it uh, because um, the coalescence time for that group, according to the paper Jensen cited, but did not discuss any of its main contents, uh, just dangling the thing that there were like African haplotypes that were connected to Eurasian ones. Ah, this must be because of the flood dispersal. Except uh, the chronology involved is 9,200 to 5,600 uh, 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 yeah, uh, years ago. Uh, and um, that's another number that clearly predates uh, the wonderful world of um, the big slosh. Now, Cruciani's science work didn't stop in 2010, uh, of course, and I already had some other of his works uh, in uh, my tip bibliography. A 2019 paper he contributed to, which again, I'll be putting uh, the linking up to from uh, BMC Biology, uh, and incidentally is not in Jensen's references, even though this is a couple years earlier than Jensen's book. Um, it talked about the, the population movements uh, into the Americas after about 15,000 years ago, also not fitting in with uh, Jensen's view. We'll find out just what exactly he tries to spin later on when he does, if it tries to deal with the Americas, but uh, that's for coming attractions. Um, speaking of coming attractions, it's interesting that another relevant paper on that very R1 haplogroup um, is one from 2008, which Jensen doesn't mention at this point in his book, which is a curious omission. Curiously, though, it's in Jensen's references. Uh, and um, that means I'm going to be interested to see what the heck he does with it, given the fact that he didn't bring it up at the time when he's discussing this haplogroup. But a little spoiler, um, it relates to that group originating between 12,500 and 25,700 years ago, and most likely around 18,500 years ago, which is only three times the age of the universe uh, in Jensen's frame. So um, an even more relevant uh, paper on the R1B origins uh, that Jensen doesn't cite at all, it's not in his reference bibliography, um, is a paper from 2016 by Fu on the genetic history of Ice Age Europe, and I'll be sticking a link up to that. So we've got lots of information that in a world that um, he's not recycling material from his earlier book, that's quite clear. The vast majority of the stuff that he's trotting out this time is fresh material, but not particularly relevant fresh material. Um, now we'll get on to uh, why I'm bringing up Lauren Bobert. Um, she was grilling in Congress a little ways ago, uh, one of the representatives from, um, a commission, uh, in Washington, DC that had come up with these new, uh, legal rules, which, um, drew a conniption fit from culture camp conservatives and, uh, the, um, uh, McCarthy, uh, Congress, um, uh, overruled it and, um, uh, our little uh, pal Biden decided not to veto it because there were some side provisions in there that he was okay with and all that. So he decided to go with it. But, but that neither here nor there, 
it was the methodological interests about what Obert was doing in her grilling. She clearly had a sheet of paper that she was reading off of, and she had a script she was working off of. And I think she was terribly proud of it because she was accusing this guy of being the ringleader, the, the cheerleader, the, the vanguard, the, the veritable point person for um, this uh, ruling, which included her obsession, the decriminalization of urinating in public. And um, it was an interesting thing because of how the conversation went with her grilling the, the person. Um, she asked him about, uh, was this law in Washington, D.C.? Which was a peculiar thing to say because, of course, it wasn't law because it was just overruled by Congress and she had voted to overrule that. So what the hell was going on? But the guy correctly said, no, it's not. It's not actually law. Then she was trying to press ahead with this urination thing. Is it not the case that this law uh, decriminalized uh, urination? And he said, no, it didn't. And this kind of threw her off. And she asked again, but did, did, um, what, were you in favor of decriminalizing it? No. Um, the, and he was trying to explain that the statute in question had actually, um, uh, um, there was a proposal to switch it from, I think, a felony to a misdemeanor or something like that. But that was finally overruled. And the version that was passed that got overruled by Congress and the version that this guy voted for, as he explicitly said, had retained a criminal penalty for it. And at this point, Bulbert is just spinning in her little dogma wheel uh, that uh, she insists on this being a big thing. Now, what struck me about this First of all, the various news coverage on this paid no attention whatsoever to methods issues, which is she clearly had drawn on somebody's account of this, not connecting much to the facts. Was it from Pavda? Was it from Newsmax? Was it from OAN? Was it from some website? We have no idea. And nobody, not on NPR or NBC or ABC or any of the other various news coverage that I spotted on this, did anybody seem to be interested in that because they don't do methods issues. And uh, But yet I had seen this kind of behavior uh, over and over and over again and have been documenting that very point here in the um, discussion of creationism in that you've got people that rely dogmatically upon rote material and they get their little phrases like stuff they clipped out of intelligent design literature and so forth, and they feel themselves terribly knowledgeable on this. Uh, there's no indication whatsoever that Bulbert was doing anything different than that in her haranguing on this particular point. And so if we lived in a world in which methods issues were brought up more often, uh, maybe we might be able to clarify this more. And oddly enough, um, Marjorie Taylor Greene was on, interviewed on 60 Minutes just this evening. And there again, I was chalking down how many methods questions were asked of her. And the answer is none. She was asked about her opinions on things and her reaction to stuff and whether how she justified her behavior, which was often rather snotty. And she gets very defensive and, and, and truculent in her responses on this, but that, that's neither here nor there. What fascinated me about it is that at no point did it occur, if there was anything that was asked about it, it was certainly not in the episode that was shown, um, where she gets her information from on things, and does she ever try to fact check it? This is the universal question that anybody in any area whatsoever, if somebody says, well, RJ Downer, where do you get your sources from and do you fact check them? And hopefully it would be observable that I try to do both of those things is to let you know where I get my information from. Our little books that we write are just chock-a-block with that. And we explain the reasoning by which we go through things and, and particularly the reasoning whereby we can establish that certain people have bad methods and other people don't. And I will make a prediction that until and unless media at all levels start seriously asking source methods questions, of politicians, preferably before they get elected while they're actually running for things, we will remain in this screwball land of where you just have dueling dogmas uh, and facts pop in a little bit of fact-checking, fact, but not in terms of where they're getting their sources from. And there are examples 
um, the uh, various analytical literature in politics, uh, political coverage, where some people do actually kind of dive in to where people are getting sources from and who's copying from whom and that. It's not done nearly as publicly and as routinely. You find fact-checking elements going on on, on uh, important issues. Uh, our local uh, TV channels, one, um, the CBS affiliate, interestingly enough, um, uh, engages in fact checking and they will be talking about claims about viruses or claims about tax law or various things. And they will actually give information which is available on their website as to the sources they've relied on and all that. Uh, that kind of material is not done nearly enough, but at least it's done some, but it's not pressed into case when we're dealing with people getting asked about stuff. So, um, Whenever anybody is making assertions, and especially even when they're agreeing with you, uh, you should be wanting to know their source material on things. And, and people who are reluctant to offer the material or details that can be checkable um, are raising methodological flags independent of their ideology. The fact that people who have genuinely a screwball uh, I saw all my papers weren't cogent, good sources. Yes, <laughs> ah, indeed. Yeah, that's that's the whole bit about it is that you can't build a proper grounding on the basis of claptrap. And I would contend that Marjorie Taylor Greene and uh, Lauren Bolbert, uh, if you could pry open what sources they're relying on, are in their own respects exactly as incompetent as people who copy stuff from Kent Hovind and think they're knowledgeable. So uh, what's part three, the normal part two of the show? Uh, this one is one from Frank Sherwin from a couple years back, 2021, an ICR posting. And he went all gee whiz. By the way, I use the gee whiz term uh, um, as kind of a surrogate for the old term of natural theology. So I will put a little thing in here. Natural theology equals gee whiz, which is... Um, the process of looking at nature from a design perspective and going, ooh, look at how complicated and wonderful and spectacular that is, must be God. And that's the internal structure of uh, that kind of argument. Uh, natural theology, uh, the counterpart to that in anti-evolution apologetics is origins or bust, which is, well, where did fill in the blank come from? Usually life, but sometimes it's matter and the universe and the earth and various other things. But um, uh, people who find that natural theology, gee whiz stuff, mires them in too much detail that they don't want to talk about will usually scamper off to, to uh, origins or bust. But in Sherwin's case, um, he doesn't realize how close to the precipice he is on this. He's talking about um, cuttle bones, which are kind of cephalopod. And he's uh, chortling about a paper from 2020 by Yang, which I'm putting in, that's from PNAS, which is discussing its mechanics, but it didn't mention evolution. See, evolution is absolutely useless. Well, you, the moment you start looking into the dynamics of things, you start understanding why there was no discussion at this point about evolution. Um, it's just a clue that we're dealing with a murky area where little groundwork has been done. They're doing the very earliest analysis of a topic. And so they're not trying to speculate about its evolutionary origins or systematics or anything else because they're just setting out the data field. And there is a certain tendency of gee whiz arguments to be tiptoeing into areas that are kind of cutting edge research. By the way, cutting edge research that their creationists aren't doing. Uh, it's somebody else that's actually doing the heavy lifting. Anyway, um, the thing that gets left out on this uh, is a lot. Um, I'll be putting a link up to a paper from Bonad in um, 20, 2006, Morphological Character Evolution of Molecular Trees uh, is the Cuttlebone a Robust Phylogenetic Marker, which to kind of the analysis of where study of this a, a few years back. Um, and uh, they were basically saying, you know, we need to have more of the genetics. And um, another paper from uh, 2007, uh, Fuchs, uh, there we go. Let's see if I can get you a little puppy little thing. I know I'm a clumsy old man. I, I, I'm so tired. I'm 
plunking along in this way, but that's what I am. Um, when uh, the gladius shape uh, from up the uh, Jurassic, I call attention to the word platen cult in there. That's one of those cute little words which we will be getting back to in just a moment. And um, uh, that Fuchs paper could still tease out some of the relationships in the Jurassic um, cephalopods that were preserved in platen cults. Um, those who have read volume one of The Rocks Were There will know Jackson and I had quite a little section on platen calcs. I'll put the little word in there. Platen calcs. It's one of those cute little German words that is a subset of Lagerstätten, of deposits that are exquisitely preserved. And the one thing that was interesting about platen calcs, uh, Solnhofen in uh, Germany is an example of a platen calc. A uh, platen calcs are preserved in extremely calm sedimentation, ever so gentle, and oxic, so the bacteria and stuff can't get rid of it. But the sedimentation part that's laying down is so calm and serene and like nothing at all, like the cataclysmic wave crushing um, big slosh. So any attempt to try to attribute those sort of fossils to that uh, would be a terrible problem. But of course, uh, Sherwin doesn't get that far. Uh, all he's doing is gee whizzing on existing cuttle bones in a research area that's a new branch. So, uh, oh, hi, purple, green and sentient beings. Yes, we, we do try as much as possible. Um, cuttle bone proteomics is also exceedingly uh, recent, as in the last half, uh, half dozen years. Uh, there's some stuff that's been done by um, uh, Le Pabic. They've written a couple different papers on this, not all of which are available in uh, public access, but I will be putting one from the uh, Royal Society on the three-dimensional structural evolution of the cuttlefish shell from embryo to occult, adult stages. So in other words, they're trying to work out just what's going on from the whole process of development in extant cuttle bones. There are um, other material parts uh, where they've done proteomic analysis. Uh, that one, unfortunately, isn't uh, open access yet, so I, I won't be putting the link into that one. Um, so they're identifying some of the embryology of that. Um, the, uh, the Yang work would represent more the what is going on here level, and all of that has to be settled before you get to the, well, what's the evolutionary origin of all of this stuff, and how does it fit into larger pictures? So... One of the things to keep an eye out for with any anti-evolution apologetics is when they are playing the gee whiz card. And what you'll probably want to do, as well as looking up whatever technical papers they're waving at you, is start looking at the sidebars of if it's an exceedingly recent paper that's laying out fundamental information that wasn't previously known, well, duh, that's a dead giveaway that you've got something that is a cutting edge field and there's gonna be future work on it and therefore put a little post it and follow up on that in future. So I wasn't really paying attention to cuttle bones, including Jurassic uh, examples, but I've started looking into it precisely because Sherwin was making such a big deal out of it uh, in that 2021 paper. Um, there are works uh, on, um, Oh, a 2011 paper on uh, cephalopod evolution and that anyway, but unfortunately that's not an open access one, so I won't be putting the link in on that uh, part. Um, I've just uh, been adding in some more um, of the scientists' names. I keep track in my tip project of who actually is doing the science work of the various papers that I cite. So all of the authors, I always wondered how the cuttlefish ended up with its shell on the inside. Yeah, that. that that's one of the interesting little little sidebar issues about the developmental process of, um, and I think part of that is looked into in some of these little features that you've got the way the embryolic embryology process works that differs from the ones that have external shells like in the other cephalopods and, and, and um, or the ones that have given up shells completely. I think if memory serves me, some some of the octopuses or um, some of the squids have tiny, like the leftovers of a shell internal structure thing that's gotten kind of 
formed and then it disconnects. Uh, but I'd have to, that, I'm just going off on memory on that. Um, and needless to say, of course, you've got such a huge variety and those organisms have been around a really long time, including extinct forms like the ammonites uh, that we don't know what their proteomics are because they've been extinct since like the Permian or something. Uh, or no, I think they, I think they went out in the Cretaceous. Um, and um, so you can't look at those for comparative processes. Uh, I guarantee you that had ammonites live down to the present and you were able to look at the genome of ammonites to compare to nautiloids and the various other cephalopods that that would be extremely useful and informative in terms of the branching times and all that kind of stuff but all of that has to be inferred genetically from only the forms that we have existing um anyway i think the only rigid part of octopods uh octopods was the, well, in the adult form yeah but I, if memory serves me there's little the little there are aspects of things in the developmental process that relate to some of that stuff that ends up in other organisms ending up as a full-blown shell system and but yet it's just vestigial uh in that and if i've made a goof up on that let me know but um uh i'm just riffing off of my memory here in terms of stuff that was looking into that in these various papers um because they, they represent such a gigantic amount of time hundreds of millions of years you know it's duh that there's going to be a, an enormous amount of variation and development going on. And you've had cyclic groups as some groups are have dominance and then they kind of flip away as the ecological system works. And, and another feature that relates to that is, is what availability they have of the molecules to make the shells. So there's a bit about, I think calcium is the current one, but there's, I think there's phosphorus or something that's used that as an other form of uh, phosphates. Uh, and uh, I think just recently there was a, a material on the Devonian phosphate crisis that the shift in uh, the amount of phosphate available in the oceanic environment suffered a big drop during that period. And uh, you find organisms that were having to make use of that as their things kind of flipping over. And you still find some that still make use of phosphorus, but most have moved over to the new thing like calcium. And the same way that, that um, uh, ocean chemistry, when diatoms came along, they completely upset the way things were entering into the water column. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why things like the White Cliffs of Dover and all of that stuff don't form easily anymore because diatoms are there using up the stuff that would normally make uh, the um, uh, material that would end up as um, uh, well, uh, it's not, it's not, uh, the white cliffs of Dover is a different kind of a, uh, uh, the name escapes me at the moment, but it's one of occasionally creationists have called attention to, well, why don't we find that forming today? Well, it's because of diatoms. And, uh, this was, goes way back because I mentioned it in my old tip work and that, so it's been decades ago on there. Anyway, um, I've been putting in the names of the various scientists that write the papers. And I use this as an additional benchmark because of course creationists love to tout their famous scientists that they have in their field that have PhDs, uh, the Discovery Institute, and their only PhDs allowed to sign dissent with Darwin, although the vast majority of them are not scientists. And uh, if they are, they're not terribly relevant to the fields, they're relevant to evolution. And occasionally there are a few like Baumgartner who are young earth creationists and they don't really think too closely on that point. Um, altogether, you know, you've got um, a thousand signatories on the Discovery Institute list. La -di -da. There's probably a much larger body of people, even with degrees, who would be classified as anti evolutionists. Let's say an order of magnitude bigger. So we're talking maybe 10,000 people, of which most would be pretty much keeping silent about it because they don't want to get into trouble or they just don't care about it or they kind of keep it under wraps. So let's postulate all. Some of the stupidest people have PhDs. Leo Basuga. Oh, yes, yes. Just like Mensa is no guarantee to being brilliant just because you can pass an IQ test. Um, of the 31,000 technical papers that I have in my reference base, they are written by upwards of 77,000 authors, individual people which you will notice is mucho bigger than 10,000, assuming we inflate the number of the Discovery Institute signatories by a whole order of magnitude. 
And you can ask another little question, which is another reason why I keep track of this stuff. <coughs> How much of that work is done by anti-evolutionists? Well, we do have a self-identified thing because you've got people who come up and say, gee whiz, I have problems with Dar Darwinism. So James Tour or uh, Michael Behe or others. Um, I've been keeping track as best I can of anti-evolutionists who have genuinely published literature. Um, it may be one or papers, it may be more extensive, uh, that have been done in regular scientific journals rather than just um, something in-house at a creationist journal. And there's over a hundred of those, way below a thousand, I should point out. And um, an, none of that is really setting the house on fire in terms of great works. I'd say in terms of publication history and impact on things, uh, somebody who's kind of sidling on over to the intelligent design movement is uh, Richard Bugs, who I believe is a religious person who has been kind of hinting, and he's a plant biologist, by the way, and, and a well-published one. I mean, he's not a trivial character in this area, but um, he hasn't been overtly anti-evolutionist, but yet, as we pointed out in Rocks Were There, Volume 1, uh, Bugs co-wrote a really strange paper with Paul Nelson, who is a Discovery Institute guy and young earth creationist, uh, on uh, orphan genes. And it was a really odd thing. We took an analysis of it and broke it down in, in the thing about why it was so peculiar and how they were dancing around material. Um, whether Bugs gets a little farther into the field uh, of anti-evolutionism, only time will tell. But the point is he stands out as a relatively rare example of somebody who is high enough on the doing active work thing that um, uh, only highlights how utterly irrelevant anti-evolutionists not only are currently, but have been for a really long time. It's hard to think of any major discipline that has had a giant cohort of um, really serious creationist contributions to it. You find tippy-toe efforts. Um, Hilbert, for example, or Hebert, um, is uh, trying to work out the creationist model of the Ice Age and transforming our understanding of climatology thereby, but other than basically publishing at ICR and citing himself at ICR, um, it's hard to see that there's much of an impact on this. And regular climatologists, as far as I know, probably have no clue that any of that's going on. But um, there's a few others in there, Vardaman and that pops around in that area. They don't like uh, you know, uh, VAR dating and all that stuff. Um, so it's an interesting little process that anybody that wants to get into this area that has a particular area of expertise, um, keep track of who are the players who actually are doing the work and to what extent any anti-evolutionists are ever bumping into it. Uh, we know, I know because I pay a lot of attention to paleontology, boy, that's not a field where anti-evolutionists are really making much of an impact. It, they do occasional stuff. Uh, and there's occasional geologists and stuff from Loma Linda University, which is an Adventist university, and they do little digs every once in a while and can do perfectly fine papers that are published in regular journals and all that. They don't mention the young earth creationist stuff. Um, and um, you find on some precise technical issues, um, they can do perfectly valid work, provided that their thinking isn't requiring their creationism actually to be the deciding factor, in which case, uh, they're not going to be able to make any headway in terms of explaining the data field. Um, and that's why I've also been trying to work out uh, practical uh, litmus test questions uh, to do when you bump into various uh, people. With an intelligent design advocate, my favorite one is how many design events were there during the Mesozoic? None of them have ever thought about that. They'd have to define what they mean by a design event and how it would be identified in the fossil record at all. Uh, and um, uh, that would also bump into the whole issues of systematics where there's no such thing as intelligent design systematics. Young Earth creationists get bogged down because they do often try to deal with too many details. And they do try to sort of kind of explain stuff with the big slosh. Um, they're, they're typically, they're either going at it with gee whiz, 
cuddle bones must be designed. I'm still waiting for the definition of kinds. Well, um, in a practical sense, they take a definition that is perilously close to species uh, definition, the Ernst Mayer one. Uh, reproductively uh, viable offspring um, is the bit. And the problem is that's the definition of or one element of uh, what a species means, at least in sexually reproducing organisms. But they can't have species be kinds. Um, they have to have families as kinds uh, in order to keep the number down on the ark. Now, to be fair, they, there are examples of the creationists trying to kind of pin things down. But it's a fun, interesting game to go by. Uh, <clears throat> one of the appendices that's going to be in volume two will be a breakdown of the Ark Encounter kind list. Now, those, of course, are only referring to the kinds that are on board the Ark. But what's fascinating about it is how slippery it is in relation to certain categories of families when uh, why are they listing certain things as families? Is it because they've done any original work on this subject? It looks kind of like they've just copied Wikipedia and gone down through the various taxonomic groups, often in exactly the same order that they are on Wikipedia, uh, that are effectively following evolutionary systematics. Um, I'm not expecting ever there to be a really comprehensive analysis of all those dreadful organisms outside of the ark. Arthropods. Whoa, there are a lot of arthropods. And on what basis are they planning on doing them? At that point, um, you get into um, a vagary that I don't think they can ever go away from. And also, uh, Joel Duff did a, a posting on this on his um, video thing a little bit ago, noticing the same thing about how creationists at the grassroots level seem to have no idea that creationism allows speciation. And that at the grassroots level, when they think of a kind, they're thinking of speciation because when somebody asks them or they want to ask somebody, well, show me one kind turning into another, they mean one species turning into another, which is speciation, which the creationists, AIG, etc., technically allow because it's operating within the created kind. Now, as soon as you get far enough up the systematic ladder at the family level, because you've got super families and others, there's going to be blurry lines. And at that point, the creationist is not doing anything on it. So what they have to do is to pare down the examples that they use to manageable levels. Some of them are at the well below family level. Uh, and uh, then, of course, they've got the double whammy problem. Oh, busy catching up. Yes. Hello, Gregory. Um, just to reprise since you had Aardvok talking to Noah. What do you mean you brought only two ants? Yes. Um, uh, and Dapper Dino brought up a thing about um, the uh, koala is the fact that um, uh, koalas are not fond of eating anything except live leaves on a tree. If you hand them a dead bush that you've pulled up and it's not an actual living thing, they don't much like that. And John Woodmer kind of skirted around that because he thinks you could have kind of like dried powdered eucalyptus leaves, you know, that you could have put on the ark uh, that uh, the critter would be perfectly happy with, which I imagine there are some koalas that will get by with that, you know, but by and large, they don't think about that too much. And um, uh, any of these animals that have highly specialized, specialized diets like that, plus all the little parasites and all that, that I mean, that's a whole other um, issue. But Always lurking in the background is the Sword of Damocles because they can't follow the families are kinds thing rigorously. And that's because of us. They can't allow humans to uh, be just the hominid family. Uh, and that's, and so they have to start drawing the line often in hilarious way. Termites are the only ones that had an abundant food supply. Yeah. Uh, well, th that's another whole issue about what insects, not all of which are terribly uh, water resistant, uh, do in uh, during the big slosh. Uh, and of course, what happens um, 
oh, like uh, some creationists have tried to rationalize that uh, ammonoids uh, went extinct after the flood because the oceanic environment changed in ways they are not going to discuss in any detail whatsoever. Um, that you get that degree of ad hoc evasion when it comes to that systematics. And we bring up an awful lot of that subject. Uh, and the confusion that's going on in their own technical literature. Uh, and it's never going to get any better. Um, the improving systematics that you get as people pay more and more attention to sorting out the genetic data of existing forms and then systematically based on the morphology of stuff, uh, it's a constantly moving target uh, that people who are keeping active uh, stretch of the technical fields are well aware of. But creationists are by and large, farther behind the curve. You find a handful is in probably less than this number. Uh, oh, Ken Ham would have made his argument far easier if he just said all dinosaurs were killed in the flood. Yeah, yeah, well, they've got... Um, remember, Ken Ham is not the most original thinker. He's a secondary parasite based on the material that he already has. And by the time Ken Ham enters the picture in the really 1980s, 90s period, there's already an extant... Um, love that the aardvark is translated earth pig, yeah. <laughs> um, that the um, um, extant organisms uh, discussed by the creationist literature uh, already had a backlog of stuff that uh, since the whole point of the ark was to preserve stuff, there was an, an inbuilt reluctance to suggest that anything that came off the ark was going to drop dead. Although even they can't get around it in their 1,400 kinds aboard the Ark. 56% of them go extinct, uh, 54, 56, somewhere in that. It's over half. By their own account, their own numbers listed as extinct organisms versus kinds versus uh, surviving kinds. So that was a piss poor uh, pres preservation system. Um, and as well, they're already... Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, they all tell you. Well, remember, uh, a purple, go ahead and, and just catch up on the show later because you can just copy down. Copy down. I, when I do, when I come across videos and stuff, when I'm watching them and I'm going, oh, this is longer than I'm going to be expecting, uh, I'll just copy the URL on the thing into a, like a word processor file. Um, I, usually I have one open, like my reference bibliography, and I can just put it in there temporarily and then come back to it uh, at a convenient thing. If I'm going to be taking notes about the bloody thing, yes, I typically. As fun as it is to watch shows live that way, I'm often wanting to pause and stop, which you can't, which you can do in a live uh, feed. But then you're falling farther and farther behind. So if you're in the chat thing, your chats aren't synchronized with everybody else's, and they, it's a mess. So I, uh, from a scholarly point of view, most of the time I will be watching a thing after the fact. Uh, although I might jump in if it's somebody that I know, Jackson does various analyses and the like, I'll just pop in for a little bit and say hi, and maybe once in a while sit all the way to the end. Uh, it all depends. Um, but um, the the whole bit, of the, by the time you get into the Ken Ham secondary era, your Dwayne Gishes and Henry Morris's and all the rest have already laid out the argument that there might be living dinosaurs in the Congo and Dwayne Gish should be talking about um, newspaper accounts of pterodactyls that were shot down in Arizona. I'm not making this up. And um, it's going to be discussed in volume two if you're not already aware of the, uh, of the thing. Um, and so Ham, who is a very conservative and doesn't do his own research guy ever, all he does is kind of siphon off the lore he's acquired and an awful lot of his material is really old in his head. So he's carrying around baggage with an awful lot of little stickers on them and, that have Dwayne Gish and others over them. Um, and he's not that aware of even the works at his own group. One of the things that pops up about this uh, current jihad that Ken Ham has launched um, to purge the evolutionary creationists like Todd Wood and all that from the bunch. Um, and uh, Joel Duff pointed out is that Ham apparently doesn't read their own material because the cat's out of the bag on stuff. Like, like, do you have to date the earth as about 6,000 years? Some people at his own Answers in Genesis um, journal um, uh, have uh, discussed the idea that you can go out to about 10,000 years. So I think it exceedingly likely, given the enormous number of claptrap that it's pushed out, 
at their journal and it, you've got decades of product out there, Ken Ham is not going to have read much of this. <coughs> it's very possible he doesn't even go farther than just perusing the titles, even if that. It'd be an interesting scholarly bit to know that if anybody is um, closer aware of the day-to-day -day operations of Ken Ham at AIG, um, uh, whether or not, you know, like an ex-employee or somebody that, that could be discussing this point, I'd love to know because I would be slightly less um, dismayed by the guy if he at least had the gumption to pay close attention to their own product. But I have no reason, given the fact that Ham has on one occasion uh, still drawn the line in the sand about no horse evolution, long after uh, not only the baromenologists have moved the goalpost there, but his own Ark Encounter has a Dino Hippus as the archetypal horse. That's a lot of horse evolution going on. That was a form of ancestral horse that is at the cusp where you drop the final toe uh, bit. You have still vestigial toes in some of the uh, genera of uh, species in the genus uh, at that point, although the creationists don't get that close to the data field to notice. But the thing is, is that the Dwayne Gish era creationist would have been absolutely adamant. Another one is giraffes, you know, where um, uh, Dwayne Gish dumped on the very idea of a short neck giraffe ancestor. But what do they have in the Ark Encounter? An Okapi style short necked giraffe uh, as the ancestor for them. So, so they've adopted an awful lot of these features in his own museum. And I don't, if I think if he walked through there with you, uh, I think his eyes would probably glaze over kind of the way Lauren Bulberts did <laughs> in Congress when you get a pushback because all she knows and all Ken Ham knows is the stuff that's filtered through in that secondary account. So um, uh, it's a single methodology, one methodology to rule them all is my motto. Uh, and that you want to ask people where they're getting the source material from and how they're analyzing it. And um, there's every reason to think that if you were to take a Lauren Bulbert and a Ken Ham and it looked at them exclusively methodologically, they're going to shake out the same end of the bag. So I think that covers the material on there. We'll be sticking all that fun and games notes in there uh, as we continue our little process. I, I, I keep on puzzling about the fact that he go that Jensen goes through so many pages without any references. Once in a while, some of the little gen generic books, and you know, he puts in for authority quotes and stuff, you know, on descriptions of scenic places and that. But the technical literature is really sparse, and he's got a pretty good chunk of them in his reference bibliography. So when does he plan on deploying them? That's what I'm really, is, is it gonna be like this deluge at the uh, towards the tail end of the book when he gets ever so technical or is he really gonna just kind of be ferreting through these and, and, and name dropping them in kind of the way he did in the earlier book but even more attenuated as we move along. It's gonna be a funky little thing to kind of figure out. We already know because we know how long the book is and how many sources he's got that the number of citations per page is way below that of uh, reinventing Darwin. So he can easily have a much sparser operation coming into that. So anyway, everybody stay safe. There was a little bit of snow in Spokane, although it didn't quite settle, but just a few miles out at Eastern, the, the, the I-90 was, you know, like a blizzard. Uh, so weather is all screwball all over the place. Welcome to the 21st century. Um, and um, things can be made on those terrible tornadoes and all of that, uh, that um, people have got to get on the duff and, and we have to move to a different kind of energy environment because um, if we keep increasing the CO2, it's going to be destabilizing things more and more and more. And frankly, I wouldn't buy any Miami beachfront property. Uh, that's probably not a good idea, especially if you plan on holding it on or passing it on to your descendants who will have to move to some higher ground. So <coughs> um, everybody stay safe on uh, things and uh, keep it going. Uh, yeah, too cold. The temperature's kind of been up and down and up and down. Supposedly it's going to be in the 60s uh, next week. So whoop, roller coaster, roller coaster, roller coaster. Uh, welcome to the 21st century. Uh, see you next week, kids. Uh, everybody stay safe and accept no wooden penguins.